Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Janet Danahay? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. In 2002, Janet Danahay lived in Greensboro, North Carolina. She had a low-level job, making $12 an hour, despite having earned a degree in business administration from the University of North Carolina a year earlier. Janet had dated a man named Thad Johnston for about six months. He broke up with Janet, and she didn't take it too well. Thad would later say that she was hysterical and in tears the last time he saw her on February 13, 2002. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. Janet had two friends over for dinner on February 14, 2002. After consuming alcohol, they decided to play a prank on Thad Johnston. The women started thinking of ideas. One idea was to pour fish oil in the air vent of his car. The women actually purchased a bottle of clam juice and made their way over to the Campus Walk apartment building where Thad lived. His car wasn't there, so they gave up on that idea. Instead of just enjoying the clam juice and being happy as a clam and avoiding criminal activity, the women came up with the idea of setting something on fire. Janet wanted to give her old flame a new flame. At about 2 a.m., now on February 15, Janet and her friends retrieved a can of lighter fluid from underneath Janet's sink. They returned to the Campus Walk apartment building. This was a relatively new three-story building that contained 12 apartments. The occupants were college students and recent graduates. Thad and his roommate, Victor, were in a second-floor apartment. At this point, Janet proceeded alone to the rear of Thad's apartment building and walked up the stairs to the second floor. Janet claims that she heard laughter from inside the apartment and saw Victor through a sliding glass door. Victor would later tell a different story, saying that he was asleep at the time. In a stealthy manner, Janet sprayed lighter fluid on a box of Christmas decorations, which was sitting on an old futon on the balcony. She then used a cigarette lighter to ignite the box. The flame extinguished quickly, so Janet put the lighter fluid on the futon and ignited it. Janet said that after seeing a small blue flame, she giggled and ran away. She made her way to a dumpster and disposed of the lighter fluid and some of her clothing, which had been saturated with smoke. Doesn't sound like that flame was too small after all. As it turns out, it was windy that night, and the flames spread to the entire building. At 2.30 a.m., several residents called 911 to report the fire. The stairs and the landings were made out of wood. The fire burned through them quickly and left the residents with no good way to escape. Some jumped off balconies and out of windows. Others remained in their apartments as the fire burned. Four occupants of apartment K tried to escape on the stairs. They were overcome by smoke and died on the landing. The landing later collapsed from the fire. The victims were 25-year-old Ryan Beck, his girlfriend, 24-year-old Donna Llewellyn, Donna's 21-year-old sister, Rachel Llewellyn, and the sister's roommate, 20-year-old Beth Harris. Janet would later say that she had seen the apartment building on fire from her back porch, but could not find her cell phone to call for help. She heard sirens and screaming, therefore figured everything was under control. Nothing says that everything's going to be okay more so than sirens and screaming. Later, Janet saw on the news that people had died in the fire. She spent the night praying and crying. The next morning, Janet drove to her parents' house three hours away. It didn't take long for the police to figure out that Janet was responsible for the four murders. Her friends directed the police to the dumpster where they found the lighter fluid and Janet's clothing. The state did not prosecute Janet's friends, although technically they could have been charged. Janet was arrested and charged under the felony murder rule in North Carolina. This is a law that says if a person dies during the commission of a felony, the individual committing the felony can be charged with first-degree murder. The law does not require proof of intent, motive, or even direct involvement in the death. Janet was facing the death penalty. In July 2002, she accepted a plea bargain. 
Janet pleaded guilty to four counts of first-degree murder and one count of first-degree arson. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. At her sentencing, Janet delivered a rambling and bizarre speech. She talked about how she could make the dreams of her victims go on. And she told the victim's parents, I am your family now. On December 20, 2022, the governor of North Carolina commuted Janet's sentence, which meant she was eligible for parole on January 1, 2023. At the time making this video, Janet is waiting for a decision from the parole board. Now moving to my analysis. This case has led to a lot of controversy. Many people believe that Janet should be released early. Some people even believe that Janet should have never served as many years as she did. This was yet another horror story caused by the felony murder rule, a backwards law that really doesn't serve any good purpose. They argue that Janet did not have any intent to kill, and she has been a model prisoner. Others have a completely different view. They say that Janet can't possibly serve enough years in prison to make up for the devastation that she caused. They argued that she knew what she was doing when she accepted life in prison without the possibility of parole. Her early release would represent a betrayal to the families of the victims. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that Jennifer should remain in prison, starting with the factors that support this idea. Before being arrested, Janet had been in trouble one time for playing a prank. When she was in high school, Janet was caught committing an act of vandalism. She decorated a motor vehicle with syrup and kitty litter. She appeared to have a fascination with damaging motor vehicles. The first prank she considered on the night of the murders involved vehicles as well. On February 15, 2002, Janet used lighter fluid to set fire to objects adjacent to an occupied structure. She first attempted to set a box on fire, but failed. Therefore, she ignited a piece of furniture. Any reasonable person would have known this activity would likely lead to death and destruction. This is different than setting a welcome mat on fire or burning a paper bag, although those activities could be dangerous as well. Janet knew or should have known that she was committing arson, and arson was a felony covered under the felony murder rule. After Janet set the fire, she fled the scene and disposed of evidence connecting her to her crime. Janet admitted that she watched from afar as the building burned, claiming she could not find her cell phone. After this, she left the area and went to her parents' house. Janet pleaded guilty in order to avoid the death penalty. She understood her sentence would be life in prison without the possibility of parole. None of the victims had any connection to Janet. They were completely innocent. Moving to the factors that support Janet's argument to be released, despite Janet's vandalism behavior in high school, she was pro-social when she was younger. Janet was a member of the Girl Scouts, played a musical instrument, and carried the Olympic torch during part of the run to the 1996 Summer Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia. Based on her crime, it sounds like Janet was still carrying a torch in a couple of ways. Janet was only 23 years old when she committed the murders. After initially attempting to avoid the consequences of her behavior, Janet did accept responsibility. She pleaded guilty even though the prosecution had not decided whether or not they would seek the death penalty. Janet believed that she needed to spend her entire life in prison to make up for her crimes. She also wanted to spare the victim's families from a trial. The state conceded that Janet never intended to harm anyone, much less kill anyone. Janet made numerous efforts to demonstrate remorse. She asked to meet with the family members of victims. She learned about her victims. She wanted to advance their interests that they had when they were alive. For example, one victim wanted to be a music teacher Therefore, Janet tried to start a choir in prison. One victim volunteered to help domestic violence survivors. Janet tried to start a support group with that same theme. Janet was denied permission for both of these endeavors, but one could argue that it's the thought that counts. Janet has worked in prison and participated in many educational programs. By every account, she was a model prisoner. Janet wants to commit her life outside of prison to warning young people about the dangers of impulsivity. When considering the evidence, is Janet's release from prison justified? In my opinion, yes. Janet should have probably been convicted of manslaughter instead of first-degree murder and been sentenced somewhere around 20 to 30 years in prison. In addition, 
she has done just about everything she could do in order to demonstrate remorse. Moving to the next section, here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, there are those who place some of the blame in this case on the building quality of the apartment complex, like should a fire on a futon have spread so quickly and caused so much damage. The building was built to code, and it was inspected the month before the fire. It was equipped with fire extinguishers and smoke detectors. The victims could not have known this at the time, but if they had remained in their apartment and not tried to go downstairs, they probably would have survived. Item number two, it seems that, at least initially, the number of people who wanted Janet to pay a severe penalty vastly outnumbered those who didn't. At her sentencing, the courtroom was full of angry people. Janet only had a few supporters on one bench. Reportedly, even some of her own family members were disgusted with her for committing the murders. The father of one of the victims has advocated for Janet, but family members for the other three victims have not been as forgiving. Even a few of the people who forgave Janet still wanted her to be executed. The terms forgiveness and execution are rarely used together in this way. Moving to my final item, number three, what do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Janet was an impulsive young woman who was unable to regulate her emotions. When her boyfriend broke up with her, she developed a burning desire for revenge. She was a little bit sadistic. For example, she had a history of syrup and kitty witter fueled vandalism, and she and her friends would regularly play pranks on each other. Janet was determined to make her new boyfriend suffer for rejecting her. She knew that the pranks she was considering were crimes. After her unsuccessful attempt at arson with the box of Christmas decorations, Janet had a chance to walk away. Instead, she poured lighter fluid on the futon in order to guarantee a large and destructive fire. She was not willing to be denied her revenge. Janet did not fully understand the properties of fire. When she saw the apartment complex engulfed in flames, she was sad, but also wanted to escape responsibility. Over time, Janet came to comprehend how much damage she caused, especially the loss of life. At some level, she did have true remorse. Rather than resist the efforts to vilify her, Janet joined them. She wanted to suffer. She believed that she needed to in order to achieve justice. This is unusual in the world of people accused of crimes. There really wasn't a defense. Everybody was with the prosecution, even Janet. I think Janet may have been profoundly affected by all the anger and vitriol. It may have felt good for her to plead guilty, like it was a relief. It helped with the anxiety caused by the unending vilification. Janet's bizarre and disturbing speech at sentencing was not meant to offend people. She was actually trying to help the victims' families. She was trying to communicate how sorry she was. Janet accepted a life sentence without complaint, but that did little to ease the anger of others. Once in prison for a while, Janet started to have a change of heart. Prison is not really about experiencing remorse. It is not some magical journey of contrition. Originally, prisons were conceptualized that way. They were even called penitentiaries, but the reality of prison is brutal and unforgiving. It is not a place for redemption. It is a place of suffering. Janet could only say that she was sorry so many times. There was nothing she could do to bring her victims back. At some point, the experience of daily prison life just felt repetitive. Janet was ready to get out. She forgave herself for committing the four murders and made numerous efforts to gain her freedom. She was probably surprised to learn that the anger against her did not subside much over time. Now moving to my final thoughts. The criminal justice system in the United States is adversarial. It is the state against the defendant. The state always tries to punish a defendant, and in theory, a defendant always tries to protect themselves. This case underscores why it is important that each team remain loyal to its cause. If both the state and the defense have the same goal, to punish the defendant, then the sky is the limit as far as sentencing. Even if a defendant feels remorse, they need to defend themselves. The state doesn't really care about remorse. They say that it makes a difference, but this case proves that it does not. The state's only interest is to fan the flames of punishment. Those are my thoughts in the case of Janet Donahay. 
Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.